<coughs> I'm sure people will be kind of uh, coming in gradually as well as I do this. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, um, as it's Christmas, I thought I'd start with a gift. Christmas! <laughs> well, I thought I'd start with the gift, actually, to be precise. Ah. <coughs> so in uh, Marcel Mauss's work, The Gift, he talks about the Polynesian concept of the how. I think that's how you pronounce it. Uh, it's the spirit of the object and the spirit of the place. Uh, for objects which contain this spirit, the material components are perceived to have a life and multiple relational meanings, uh, and in their lives they journey across space and time, often as exchange gifts, but they're always seeking to return to their place of origin. Humans have equally complex relationships with place, and for many, whether new arrivals to a place or long-term residents, a connection with the landscape and the deep history of their place can offer surprising and potentially therapeutic or healing outcomes. I encountered one such place on a project I embarked on in 2016, uh, which centred on a tract of land between two very different communities. I don't know if any of you know Hampshire, but uh, there is just north of Andover a place called NML and Main, and it's a, uh, a settlement that really was constructed just after the Second World War for people who had come out of uh, Alamein, uh, there were injuries, and, and a lot of the houses were purpose-built to try and look after people with these injuries. Um, interestingly, uh, mo more recently, Andover has sort of grown towards Enum Alamein, and where you can see that uh, East Anton there, there is a whole new estate being developed. And it's got lovely uh, names like Saxon Way and you know Caesar's Drive and things like that. So they really, even with the names of their estate, appeal to the past in different ways. But I was contacted whilst doing my PhD at Southampton um, by someone who I'd known in, from my previous museum experience. Uh, would I help this particular group to uh, do a dig an excavation of an area of land that they owned uh, where they were actually planting trees as a charitable activity. So what they would set up, they were called Andover Trees United, they were set up to work with schools to plant trees to sort of teach them about nature. The location of this particular site where they were actually going to put a pond in place to make the landscape more attractive around their saplings was where that star is. And it was very interesting to me because it sat between these two communities. And when I was having a conversation with uh, the, the particular community group who were saying to me, would you just help us with this? They knew me from a previous life in the museums and I did community work uh, with them at the time earlier. I, I looked at this and thought, isn't it interesting that you've got quite an older established community at Animal Main. You've got the new community at East Anton, and talking to people, talking to the community groups, they actually hardly saw each other, spoke to each other, had very different sort of sense of identity. They didn't relate to each other in any way. And this tract of land was actually a barrier between the two communities. And I did wonder to myself, uh, if we did some work there, which you know I've already agreed to do, uh, just to help them out, what about something that puts a spin on it, where we look at perhaps bringing these two communities together in some way, or at least starting that process, starting a conversation in this tract of land and seeing it less as a barrier and more as a bridge? And so that was the kind of aspiration, really. <coughs> the aim was to create that bridge between the communities. Also, to raise awareness of the historic and natural heritage, Given the fact that my key partner, in fact the lead partner in this, was Andover Trees United, and their whole sort of being was about planting trees with schools, with other people, and to actually create this sense of an awareness of the landscape, of the natural landscape, and a respect for it as well. The, the land that they owned and that they were planting in had suffered a bit because vandals from the new uh, community being developed uh, on the other side of, of this tract of land apparently were coming in and they were destroying some of the trees and they were vandalising some of the um, functional buildings that they had there. So we thought, okay, we'll target local schools, uh, 
and parents, and we'll also talk to the local community in, in, in both places. I also got some, some funding as I was a postgraduate, uh, doing my PhD at the university, from a, a body at Southampton called Peru, a public engagement research unit, and they gave me a little bit of money to, to sort of match fund some of the activity Andover Trees United were doing. So basically, toilets is what we were after. We got our toilets and we got a few other bits and pieces. Uh, bizarrely, I also managed to uh, invite three colleagues of mine to come along who were busy doing their own PhDs as well. So this is very much a side project, one of whom was Ellie, strangely enough. So Ellie will appear again in her photo here. <laughs> so the site itself... Um, and I've spoken to HER and, and lots of uh, other people about this, but uh, basically we were looking at where that's sort of uh, orangey-purple um, bit of uh, colouring is. There's a Bronze Age burial mound. There's another one uh, slightly to the south of that. And there is an Iron Age enclosure as well. So these are all known features. But my initial uh, view of this site was that it would be incredibly... Um, powerful in that sense of the sort of spirit of place, as I mentioned earlier on. And uh, speaking to HER, the historic environment, David Hopkins there, he, he really liked this landscape. And he'd done drawings, his own drawings, of uh, what he thought it might have looked like. He was imagining it back in the Bronze Age and in other periods as well. So he drew this sort of chronology uh, as it changed um, over time. And I must admit, before I visited the site, I did have this uh, impression that the site would be you know, quite a powerful landscape to, to visit with barrows, uh, and I could really get a sense from that visible heritage that was mentioned earlier on by Claire, you know, that sense of visible heritage, what, uh, you know, what would come out of that. And when I arrived uh, to actually look over the site, I actually discovered what I can only describe as um, a windswept rise mm -hmm with a solitary steel container <laughs> uh, just sitting there, and um, rows of newly planted saplings. However, I did come across a very vibrant uh, group of people, the local charity, who were all very keen to get involved, no expertise at all in archaeology, uh, and the historic dimension to this site for them was entirely new. But it, actually, this project did allow us together to talk about our outcomes, to think about how we'd evaluate it, uh, to think about, uh, in my case, I, I, as my museum background, I wanted to use museum-based evaluation techniques as well to try and understand some impacts, and I'll talk about those briefly in a minute. But they were very much fully on board with uh, the four PhD, uh, if you like, students coming along and joining in and seeing us very much as experts, which was interesting for us because sometimes we felt we weren't expert, but we did had this real sense of uh, you know, engagement with that historic dimension, that archaeological dimension, as well as with the nature of the site. We got to work. We had uh, 40 community volunteers who, in various means, were brought on board from two different communities. Uh, seven schools in the two-week period. It was actually quite hard work. And I realised, um, as we were digging, and we had all ages, I have to say that as well, so uh, this chap came along with a, a kind of uh, his own portable uh, digger as well, who I don't think got joined in very much. But you can see Ellie is actually there, in the middle of the, <coughs> the top right photo. We had all sorts of people joining in, but as we were digging, I realised that even though there were no features at, uh, arriving, and that's why we started saying, rather than between the barrows, we'll call it between the archaeology, um, the volunteers didn't seem overly concerned about that. So it's interesting what you say, Claire, about the visible thing. There was nothing visible. They were actually participating in the process of archaeology, of digging. There wasn't a lot coming up. There were quite a few flints. But they had a delight in finding what, to me, were the most mundane artefacts, including natural flint, which they would run away with and say, is this you know, something? And, but there was something going on there that was very interesting. The whole social thing was incredibly important, working together and connecting with our locality. In a sense, I, I, I realised they were learning you know, skills, and they felt they were learning skills as, as well, but there was something deeper going on as well. And this is where um, sort of, uh, I, I return to the notion of gift, in a way, in my mind, because it occurred to me, really, that the objects in the landscape were being offered up as a gift. 
and the past was being revealed and participants were actively creating that connection with the landscape and the objects they were encountering. And I think they were seeing it as a gift in a way. It was coming to them not as... Um, and I think it's very troublesome for heritage in general. And I, I note from uh, many of the museums I've worked in where charges and that very instrumental practice is beginning to be applied. The public don't always agree with those practices because I think they see heritage as a gift, not as a commodity. And I think there's a bit of an issue there. However, as we went on, we, um, you know, we did realise uh, it was quite exciting to participate. There wasn't a great deal that came out of our excavation. It's an interesting idea, though, to dig between the barrows <coughs> and see what you can, what activity does occur between these monuments. But we did evaluate um, the school and the, the sort of community responses. And I used memory clouds, <coughs> teachers' questionnaires uh, to get various responses. And I tried to then uh, classify them according to GLOs, generic learning outcomes, which is a standard in the sort of museum world. And it's being used in other practices as well. Uh, and I find it quite useful to use GLOs. So you're looking at five categories of learning, if you like, and then trying to actually categorise. And you can even categorise responses that are drawn as well into GLOs and what you know they tell you. And you come up with a table. Uh, in this case, I had different responses to some degree from the teachers as from the pupils. And that in itself was interesting, that the group formerly participating had very different kind of responses to that environment, to that landscape. So the teachers were really interested in, um, more than anything else, the kind of, uh, you know, the knowledge, the skills, the behaviour even. So what happens as a result of this? What have they learned and how can they demonstrate what they've learned later on? Whereas for the pupils, a massive part of what they were interested in was the actual participation, the skills, getting involved in the hands-on, and the enjoyment was a big part of it. In effect, you could say what they were doing was, you know, really interested in the intrinsic experience, whereas the teachers were interested in the instrumental experience. Um, as for the public who participated, I captured um, through a kind of end sort of uh, questionnaire, in a way, this sort of uh, response, and, and by no <coughs> means as thoroughly uh, analysed or understood as, as the sort of work that Claire has been talking about earlier on. But what really struck me was that notion of connection. A lot of them, and they use the word connection, you know, and they were talking about sense of place, connection, and these are their responses, totally uninvited. Incredibly um, evocative responses, and in some cases, you know, people talking about it releasing something special. It's not just about artefacts, it's about the birds were singing here 3,000 years ago just as they are now. I felt a connection with the human activity. Our fields and woods are not just blank spaces, but places where communities have lived in the past. And there were some really fascinating responses that, you know, thinking about the value um, sort of theory, if you like, in Holden, and I, I don't know if this was covered yesterday because I missed it in the, one of the talks, but Holden talks about uh, value in relation to intrinsic instrumental institutional. You know, it really struck me how much they were expressing that as Holden predicted, in, intrinsic desire to connect with the past. <coughs> and it did uh, lead me to sort of mess around with some ideas, thinking about how we perhaps enable that engagement with the past and perhaps that spirit of place. So I also grabbed um, some thinking done many, a couple of decades ago now by a chap called George Hine, who um, constructed uh, his own thinking about effective museum learning. And he was looking at uh, various types of, of, of museum learning from didactic right down to what he called constructivism. And uh, I always favoured constructivism as a, an approach. Social learning, very open, very negotiated, very multisensory. Um, and it led me um, to actually think about what I would call, I've called this my five C's of dynamic heritage interpretation. This is a provocation more than anything else. But this is the outcome, really, for me, of doing the Between the Barrows dig and a couple of other digs, where I was getting a sense that people were intrinsically fascinated by that connection with their past, by the experience. But how do we enable that? So as a start of a 10, this is what I'm going to give to you. One thing I think is important is critical histories. And I, I use that word or phrase because I'm thinking about our own understanding, not only about of the deep past of the site we're working with, 
but of the organisations we might be partnering with and the recent past of those places as well. So how do we understand what leads them to where they are, including our own organisations? Those community conversations, especially for Between the Barriers, really important where we actually negotiated an agreed outcome and we were happy with it. I've done other projects where I didn't negotiate those outcomes and the projects have fallen apart. I use the word convergence as well because I, you know, we, when we did Between the Barrows, the, the schools and the public who were engaged didn't just do the archaeology. They, they interacted with the landscape by making things, by uh, walking through the landscape. The schools were invited to do a little sort of trail around the trees and learn about the nature. And to me, it seemed that everyone there really was looking at that landscape, not just as archaeology or history, but they were looking at it as natural history and everything else as well. So convergence felt like a really important thing to think about, that convergence of um, the sort of disciplines, if you like. And uh, someone earlier on mentioned that idea of interprofessional um, links as well. Constructivism, <coughs> I'm just about there. Because uh, I think that is something that uh, really describes the really effective ways of engaging people in their learning. And of course collaboration, and that's to do with partnerships as well. So it's not just collaborating with the community, it's who else can you bring on board, whether it's Andover Trees United, universities working with other charities, other bodies, and how do you organise that collaboration? Um, so I suppose my last slide is... You know, should we be seeking that spirit of place? And, and for me, there are three key questions. How do we understand the experience of engagement with heritage? Do we really understand what that is and how do we measure it? How can heritage be used to heal communities and individuals? And we're asking that question today. And also, what role you know, do sense of place and identity play in helping to form those approaches? So I'll leave it at that. <laughs>